Most of us are made to believe that colonialism is a system that ended several decades ago and that all colonized lands in Africa and the rest of the global south are now independent. But this is a simplification and in some cases it can be a deadly one. One of those cases is Ambazonia, also known as the Southern Cameroons, which right now is engulfed in a crisis. Ambazonia is a territory located between Cameroon and Nigeria in West Africa. Since 1961, it has been under military occupation by Cameroon and most people erroneously consider it to be part of Cameroon. But an extreme majority of Ambazonians reject the legitimacy of the Cameroon regime and its military control. To understand why, one must understand the details of the history of colonialism in this region. In Amazonia, the dominant local language currently spoken is English, because just prior to the current regime, it was administered by the United Kingdom. The rest of Cameroon was under French control, and because of this, the dominant colonial language spoken there is French. For this reason, the conflict between the two regions is often referred to as the conflict between Francophone Cameroon and Anglophone Cameroon, or as it is often tellingly rendered from the perspective of the occupying regime, Cameroon's Anglophone problem. Anglophone Cameroon wants to keep its institutions and its ability to control business in English, the language the most of the people speak. Francophone Cameroon wants to bring the whole sub-region under a common language and a common set of institutions. And because of this, it works in direct and underhanded ways to dismantle and defund Anglophone institutions. Within this fabric of society, those who have access to Francophone culture are treated as full members of society, whereas those who don't are blamed for the ways they are isolated and treated as second-class citizens. For many years, there have been waves of protest over the stepchild status that is forced on the people of Ambazonia. Most of these protests have been led by students and teachers who bear the burden of this inequality in the classroom. These protests arise in response to efforts by the Cameroonian regime to dismantle Amazonia's effective and popular network of parent-teacher association and to require testing in French. The most recent wave of protests, which began in October 2016, was led by lawyers responding to an attempt to dismantle the Ambazonian common law-based judicial system and replace it with the French colonial civil law system as well as to force trials to be conducted in French. Why do Ambazonians defend their autonomous infrastructure and insist on their right to conduct business in English? Why don't they want to join their brothers in Francophone Cameroon? This is the question the power holders in Cameroon ask, and it is a question that many observers in the international community wonder about as well. Why can't those Africans just get along with each other? asks the media. Some write the conflict off as driven by internalized clinging to colonial era identities. But, from the Ambazonian perspective, colonialism has never ended, but only changed form. This tiny piece of land has been handed back and forth between Western powers too many times. In 1858, it was colonized by the British, led by Alfred Saker, in 1887, it was given to the Germans as a way to encourage relations between two European countries. In 1917, it was taken from the Germans after they lost World War I as the League of Nations Trust territory of the Southern Cameroons. In 1945, when the United Nations was created, it became a UN Trust territory still under British administration. The plan at this stage was that the trust territory phase would end with independence. Yet, there were competing agendas at play that would ultimately derail this intention. Following the end of each world war, the international moral consensus against colonialism grew, a reality reflected in the name trust territory. Many administrators of the colonies during this time took serious the task of preparing the colonies for independence. 
In Ambazonia, they worked in cooperation with indigenous communities to build hundreds of effective public institutions and farmers' cooperatives, such as parent-teacher unions. These institutions went a long way towards dismantling the unilateral control implemented during the previous stage of colonialism and returned a great deal of power and resources to the people. One of the fruits of this empowerment work is that in 1957, Ambazonia experienced a peaceful transfer of power from one elected prime minister, albeit with limited power, to another. The first such peaceful transition in post-colonial West Africa. The memory of that experience of effective democracy is still strong. Yet during this time, Britain was still benefiting economically from their colonies. Neither Britain nor France wanted to lose the economic benefit they got from these colonial relationships. So during this time, efforts were also made behind the scenes to identify ways to keep enough political control over the region so as to be able to continue to extract the resources they wanted at minimal cost. It was based on the latter logic that the power players in London determined that full independence was not an option for Ambazonia. Also partly driven by fear of the influence of communist organizing in Ambazonia, they felt an independent nation here would be too difficult to control. This motive is documented in a declassified cable sent by the then U.S. Consul General in Nigeria on May 11, 1959. So in 1961, the UN gave the Amazonian people the choice between joining Nigeria as a state or joining Cameroon as a part in a two-way state confederation. Faced with this choice, the Amazonian people opted for Cameroon in a UN-administered plebiscite. The specific proposal that the people approved was for the creation of a confederacy between the two countries in which each region would retain its language and autonomous institutions. But this vision would never be realized. Almost immediately, the Cameroon regime began to behave to the Amazonian people like a colonizer, not like a partner or a brother. It acted to undermine parliamentary process and eventually unilaterally disband the Amazonian parliament. It orchestrated the deposing of the pro-independence Ambazonian Prime Minister, Agustin Gomjua, and eventually assassinate him. It disbanded the local police force, replaced them with French Cameroon military. It gutted and eventually closed down the public works department and commandeered its heavy-duty civil construction machinery, which has previously been used cooperatively by local councils for road maintenance and repairs. It shut down the network of farming cooperatives as well as a range of other cooperatively running training and financial management organs which saw to the health, empowerment and economic effectiveness of the farming communities. It began a decades-long effort to undermine the power of the widely popular parent-teacher association network which has been resisted every step of the way by movements of teachers and students. It undermined and closed down almost every single industrial infrastructure that had fueled economic growth and employment opportunities in Ambazonia. It included two natural deep seaports, four airports, all railway lines, the public airline company Cameroon Air Transport, which had been the fastest growing airline in West Africa at that time. The Public Electronic Corporation, PowerCam, which was a pillar of economic growth and energy self-reliance, and a cooperative credit union league, and many others. It has since located all new economic projects in French Cameroon, including even building an oil refinery, Sunara, that pipes oil out of Ambazonia and into Francophone-controlled zones, where all economic transactions are managed. It has assimilated or implemented the celebration of almost every indigenous festival and local cultural tradition. And it has led to a massive gulf in economic activity between Ambazonia and Cameroon. Most Amazonians do not understand this as primarily a betrayal by Cameroonians. 
most Amazonians understand the current regime in Cameroon to be effectively under French control. In a remote village in southwest France, this former French soldier took part in a war that few people, even in France, have heard of. One which has been described as the beginning of France-Afrique, the murky relationship between Paris and its former African colonies. Bardet was sent to Cameroon between 1962 and 1964 in the western Bamileke region. He was a helicopter pilot and witnessed several massacres committed by the Cameroonian army. It was strongly supported and funded by France. That's a Bell 47 G2, 280 horsepower, a very small helicopter, just three seats. The Cameroonian army, backed by France, targeted members of the UPC, a party that opposed President Amadou Aïdjo. The UPC believed that after independence in 1960, Aïdjo was simply France's hand-picked puppet. For the first time on television, Max Bardet describes the atrocities he saw. Soldiers of the Cameroonian army were ordered to kill the men, but not the women. Women would be left to agonize. Most had been wounded by AK-47 bullets, but not only that, what I want to say is that they would also cut off their breasts and disembowel them. During these massacres, Max Bardet was accompanied by a French officer. The officer who was with me was here to be on the lookout and make sure no one would witness what was going on. That no one could ever testify or accuse France and the few members of the French military still present in Cameroon of being involved in what was going on. A new book on this topic called The War in Cameroon has just come out in France. Like most former French colonies, often referred to collectively as Franc Afrique, but rather uses the Paris controlled Central African Franc, which is a mechanism for economic control. Paul Bia, who has controlled Cameroon since 1975, has marched into the streets of Paris against the independence of this country when he was a student. He then went home and worked his way up within the ranks of the French colonial government, eventually earning the top position there and was finally handed the regions from his former colonizers. Considering these two roles in succession, he is arguably the longest reigning dictator in the world. By his own words, Paul Bia is an unapologetic puppet of neocolonialism. As he declared to the local press in Le Bol, France, in June 20, 1990, I cannot disagree with the opinion of President Mitterrand that I am the best student of France. Although all colonialism is banned, in Congo they initiated the practice of chopping off the hands of peasants to compel them to work as rubber harvesters, they have seen to the assassination of almost every single independence movement leader in the nations they had colonized, including Barthelemy Buganda of Central African Republic, Felix Mumie of Cameroon, Thomas Sankara of Burkina Faso, and too many others. In contrast, many independence leaders in non-French colonies went on to lead their countries after independence, that they said was owed to them to cover the loss of their slaves and pressured the international community to demand that they pay. In Guinea Conakry, down to unstringing electrical wires, uprooting railroad ties, and tearing up pavements and throwing the asphalt into the sea. The goal of all of this behavior is clearly to make the indigenous populations of the colonial territories into completely helpless subjects robbed of all forms of power and human dignity. While this view of French colonial behavior is not widely known in the English-speaking world, it is very well known in the realm of influence of the former French colonies, including Amazonia. From the evisceration of Amazonia infrastructure to the shooting of unarmed protesters, to the disappearance and incommunicado imprisonment of movement leaders, to the burning of villages, French Cameroon appears to be continuing in this tradition. For this reason, the movement refers to the regime as the French neo-colonial regime in Cameroon. Since December 2016, the French Cameroon military has responded to peaceful protests with force, 
killing over 400 defenseless civilians, according to activists on the ground. An additional 200 have disappeared and are feared to be dead. Over 90 villages have been burned down by French Cameroon military forces. The UN has officially registered 21,000 refugees in Nigeria, and it is estimated that a further 160,000 are displaced within Cameroon. Over 2,500 activists and peaceful protesters have been imprisoned. Some are being trialed in military courts, which is a violation of international law. And some have been sentenced for terrorism and other unjustifiable charges. These prisoners include the prominent non-violent advocate Julius Ayuk Tabe and 11 of his senior aide, who were arrested on January 5, 2018 at the Nera Hotel in Abuja, Nigeria, where they had gathered to plan a meeting with the UNHCR to discuss the refugee crisis. They were then forcibly and unlawfully repatriated to Cameroon in violation of non refoulement a fundamental principle of international law which forbids a country receiving asylum seekers from returning them to a country which they would be in likely danger of persecution. These prominent non-violent leaders have been held for over 200 days without video or picture to the public in Cameroon's maximum security building of the State Defense Secretariat in Yaoundé, which has been described by those who have survived imprisonment as torture chambers. In order to prevent people from communicating about these travesties, the government instituted a non-stop internet and cellular network blackout for over 100 days. But when communication rights activists protested this blackout, this action backfired on the Cameroonian regime and actually increased awareness of the Amazonian plight. Now the government is trying to use social media to discredit the movement. Some international media and human rights groups are parroting the regime's position. But their lies are clear for those with first-hand experience. The Ambazonian diaspora is working hard to counter these lies and to expose the political context that gives them traction.